Thanks to all the audience who follows our broadcast. We have the honor today of having Dr. Christopher Algalby. Dr. Algalby is Professor of Neurosurgery and Director of Endovascular and Operative Neurovascular Surgery at the Brain and Reason Institute, Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center. Today, at the 2021 IWBNC, Dr. Algalby is going to share a lecture on unruptor aneurysms, who to treat. Please type right your questions in the Q&A panel. We will read them after the end of Dr. Ogilvy's intervention. Welcome, Dr. Ogilvy, and thank you. It's all yours. Dave, thanks very much. I very much appreciate the organizing committee inviting me to do this. It's a great honor. Uh, and I know this symposium last year was a huge success, and I have been following this morning and today the phenomenal talks that have been given, and I anticipate the same level of success. I'm going to take on the topic of unruptured intracranial aneurysms and talk about uh, natural history and treatment-related risks, all centered around the question, who are we treating? Uh, so many of us see these patients now every single day, and I'll get into why. Um, uh, in terms of disclosures, I have none relevant to this talk. I am a consultant for a small company, not relevant to this talk. But... Uh, as vascular neurosurgeons, or even as neurosurgeons, I think everybody is running into unruptured intracranial aneurysms. And so different than 30 years ago, uh, when some of us did our residencies, because at that point in time, the most aneurysms that were seen and treated were ruptured. And the big difference, of course, has been neuroimaging. Uh, with advanced neuroimaging in increasing sensitivity and specificity, of MRI, MRA, as well as CT, CTA, combined with patients getting scans for virtually any indication, uh, a head bump, um, a history of family aneurysm, which is appropriate, uh, uh, but a variety of reasons. Uh, people will, any TIA, any neurologic event, um, headaches, uh, patients get scans. And aneurysms show up, which may or may not be related to their symptoms. In fact, many times are not related to their symptoms. Um, and we're left encountering the patient with the unruptured aneurysm and trying to make the decision of whether to leave the aneurysm alone or whether to fix it. And then, as I'll get into later, how to fix it. Well, this is really almost always a balance, as shown on the slide, between the rupture risk of that aneurysm in that individual and the treatment risk in, of that aneurysm in that individual. So the rupture risk gets into patient-specific factors which can, which can modify the rupture risk, increase it or decrease it, as well as aneurysm-specific factors. That is, is there morphologic features? Are there location features which can change the rupture risk of the aneurysm, as I'll explain. And this all comes from natural history data, which we have to date, um, uh, none of which is perfect. It's all flawed by one reason or another, but these are very difficult studies to do, to follow a large number of patients for a long interval of time to get rupture rates and then try to stratify that by location or size or other issues I'll talk about. And then on the other side of the coin, on the other side of the decision tree is the treatment related risk. That is the patient specific factors, their age, other medical comorbidities, and aneurysm specific factors. What is the risk of treating that aneurysm? And then whether we're gonna treat that endovascularly or surgically, and I have some data to share with you and, and talk about uh, in terms of that issue. And this is the, the conundrum. This is an aneurysm that I found at autopsy when I was doing neuropathology uh, in an 86 year old who died in a nursing home of pneumonia. It's a five millimeter middle cerebral artery aneurysm. And she had it at her most of her adult life probably, never knew she had it, died of something else. And here was this aneurysm we found at autopsy. And the problem is now we're finding a lot of these, obviously, during life with advanced imaging techniques. And the question comes up, how common are unruptured aneurysms? And we know that, that the prevalence at autopsy runs somewhere in the order of 2 to 5%, depending on which study you look at which means that it's estimated there's some two to five million Americans that have unruptured cerebral aneurysms. And obviously not all of these go on to hemorrhage because the hemorrhage uh, number for ruptured aneurysms in North America is about 30,000 a year. And if you do the math, uh, there's many more aneurysms that don't rupture as opposed to do. 
and we have to and we're left with the idea of trying to predict who is at higher risk of rupture and who is at lower risk well if you look back at the autopsy studies as i show the data from here um, this is where the numbers come from and they were really done in the 70s and, and early 80s but in the 70s back when we did more autopsies uh, as medical advances have occurred se uh, sequential autopsies just aren't done anymore Many patients and patients' families, more specifically, know what their loved one died of. So there's no reason to get an autopsy. So if you go to the family and ask for an autopsy, they often decline. But this was in an era when consecutive autopsies could be done. And you can see here's a study of 136 consecutive autopsies. They found 191 aneurysms uh, and they were able to measure these with calipers and get sizes of the distribution and realize these are deflated aneurysms. That is, there's no blood flowing through them at the time of autopsy, obviously. Um, but you can see here this, the, the, uh, what was identified in these particular patients in terms of size distribution uh, and numbers overall. And this is where we come up with the numbers sort of one in 50 or about 2%, two to 4% of the population harbors some abnormality you can call a brain aneurysm. Here's an autopsy study from Tennessee, a little over 13,000 patients uh, and this was in adults, so those patients older than uh, 10 years of age. And this now gives us a distribution of location of aneurysms. And it's interesting, if you think about how you do an autopsy, you, you cut the carotid artery as it comes into the head right at the paraclinoid location. And actually, these autopsy studies underestimate the actual number of aneurysms because now with advanced imaging, we see a huge number of aneurysms in the paraclinoid location. And they're sometimes tiny, they're two, three millimeters, but they're still there. And we actually did a CTA study and found that there was a significantly higher number of aneurysms compared to autopsy studies in the location of the paraclinoid where the carotid artery is cut here as it enters the, uh, the skull base. And this just shows uh, uh, several uh, autopsy studies with pooled data giving the distribution of aneurysm location um, in, in, those in those different studies, showing that, that the majority were in the anterior circulation, as we see in clinical practice. Uh, and it also gives a spread on, uh, if you look in each study, on the size of aneurysm. And this just shows the incidence of aneurysms at autopsies in a little over 1,600 patients in an Iowa study. And this, again, is from 1970. Well, we're left then, when we identify an unruptured aneurysm with current neuroimaging, of trying to predict the rupture risk of that lesion and balance that against the predicted treatment related risk of that lesion, whether that be endovascular or surgical. And our rupture risk I'll review briefly comes from uh, several major studies, as well as meta-analysis and the so-called phases score and the UTAS score, which I will review. The issuer trial is the International Study of Unruptured Intracranial Aneurysms. Uh, I was a member of this trial with Dave Weavers and, a num and 60 other centers, and um, it was sort of the first study to really look at natural history prospectively of unruptured aneurysms. There was some retrospective data in the literature, but that was flawed by the retrospective nature of it. The UCAS study is a Japanese study of unruptured cerebral artery aneurysm study it's designed very similar to the Ishua trial, but in Japan with a, a larger number of patients, over 5,000 patients. And what that allowed was some stratification by site and size of rupture risk. And I'll, and I'll walk through that with you, um, as well as the meta-analysis and the so-called phases scale. Well, when we look at the natural history as shown on this slide, we know that there are certain patient and lesion specific factors that are important. And the question becomes how important are they what percent do they throw on the natural history risk of a rupture? And these include size, which certainly is important, but not the only issue, because it's not always that the larger lesion causes the hemorrhage, as I'll show you. The location of a lesion turns out probably has some influence on risk of rupture. Now, the age of the patient is very important because this gets into predicting that patient's life horizon. So we're much more aggressive about discussing treatment of aneurysm, almost regardless of size above four or five millimeters with a 26 or 27 or 30 year old patient than we are with a 90 year old patient because the 90 year old's life projection and life horizon is very low. 
um, uh, and the younger individual has many years to live with that risk of rupture, whether it be 1% a year or half a percent a year, whatever it is. And then there are other risk factors which are modifiable, um, such as uh, smoking and hypertension, some which are not modifiable, such as ethnicity, ethnicity, but can increase the risk of rupture. And unruptured aneurysms in all studies to date are more, uh, uh, are more prevalent in females as, composed, as opposed to males. And then we look at the risks of treatment. And again, we can stratify these results based on patient and lesion specific factors, uh, which include age of the patient, the size of the aneurysm, uh, other co medical comorbidities that patient may have. A uh, patient can be 65 years old, but physiologically be, be 80. If they smoke three packs of cigarettes a day, have COPD or in a wheelchair um, and other medical issues. Now, the risk of treatment has dropped over the last 20 years. If you look at overall treatment, and I have some data to share with you in a few minutes, but there is a decreasing risk with improved technology and, and uh, methodology of treating aneurysms. And we tend to use open surgery or endovascular techniques at our center as we select the lowest risk treatment and highest efficacy. And that's a different, little bit different discussion I'll get into in terms of treatment, which is risk and efficacy of treatment. Now, prior to the issue of trial, the unruptured aneurysm trial, International Study of Unruptured Aneurysms, there were several studies that suggested hemorrhage rates in the aneurysms on the order of one to 3% per year for unruptured aneurysms greater than a centimeter in size. And David Weavers, working at the Mayo Clinic, published a paper in 1984 where he had 102 patients, 102 lesions that were smaller than 10 millimeters. And he followed these patients. And over three years, none of those lesions bled. He was a neurologist and he also had a, a population of 54 lesions in patients that were greater than 10 millimeters. And in this group of patients, 15 of the aneurysms bled over this same three years of interval follow-up with 14 deaths, a very high mortality. And David then, that led him to design and undertake the international study of unruptured aneurysms to look at the effect of size on aneurysmal rupture it was the initial goal. Of course, it did much more than that. Um, uh, and we now use this information uh, to guide our, our decision-making in, in some patients, in many patients with, um, uh, with the uh, unruptured aneurysm natural history. So the natural history study, the International Study of Unruptured Intracranial Aneurysms was actually published twice. Once was in 1998, and then the follow-up study, same data set, in the Lancet 2003. Uh, and then the, uh, there's been meta-analysis and this paper in stroke in 2007. But the international trial was really the first and landmark article that looked at rupture rates, uh, both prospective, it was really two studies in one. And the way the study was designed, there was two groups of patients, group one patients, those with no history of subarachnoid hemorrhage, group two patients were those that had a previous subarachnoid hemorrhage from another aneurysm that was repaired successfully. Each of these had unruptured aneurysms that were followed over time. And the other arm of the study was prospective evaluation of patients that were treated surgically or endovascularly. Now, the majority of the patients in that study were treated surgically, given the era of the time that endovascular techniques were really just evolving. But what this study showed was that in patients who had had no previous subarachnoid hemorrhage, the risk of rupture from a smaller intracranial aneurysm less than 10 millimeters was very small on the order of a half a percent per year. And if you had had a previous subarachnoid hemorrhage, it was 10 times higher, a half a percent per year. Greater than 10 millimeters, we're looking at about a percent per year hemorrhage rate in both groups. And then once you got into the large and giant aneurysms, the, the risk of rupture was significant, 6% in the first year of observation. So predictors of rupture in these, in these groups were increasing size, location being the posterior circulation and basilar tip, vertebral basilar, and they included posterior communicating artery aneurysms in this group, uh, were found to have an increased risk of rupture. When they looked at uh, surgical results, so one part, one piece of the study was that rupture rates were much lower than had previously been predicted. The other arm of the study demonstrated that treatment related risks followed in a prospective fashion were much higher than had previously been reported. They looked, they did a, middle, a mini mental status exam 
and showed that the overall morbidity and mortality you can see here on this slide at one month and one year in unruptured aneurysms was in, this, in the double digits. Uh, and this was quite a surprise. Now, you would think this would drive the number of treated and unruptured aneurysms down but published in the New England Journal, it was viewed by a large number of, of general physicians. And actually, if you look at incidence of treatment of unruptured aneurysms, it goes up after this publication. And we think what happened was that it, it uh, brought more attention to unruptured aneurysms. It was also an interval where more unruptured aneurysms were being discovered because of neuroimaging technology was getting better. And what the follow-up study in 2004 Sure enough, with more follow-up, more aneurysms were found to bleed. And in fact, the, the, the cut rate of where the size cutoff for the aneurysms was changed to seven millimeters. And this is data from the follow-up study demonstrating again in group one or group two, group one, no history of subarachnoid hemorrhage, group two had a previous history of subarachnoid hemorrhage. But what this data showed was that we are beginning to see some stratification, not only by size, but by site. That is the posterior location had a higher risk of rupture. Well, Uvela and others in Scandinavia have been very good at publishing data on natural history and they have a captured population. Scandinavians don't tend to move much. And when they do, they can follow them with their uh, healthcare system and the, the national database. And it was a much smaller number of patients, but followed for a long interval of time. And what they found in this study, they had a median follow-up of almost 20 years. And they found a rupture rate a little over 1% a year. 10% at 10 years, 20% at two years, and 30% at three years. So now we're back to the 1% per year. They found that younger age, larger size, and patients who smoked had a higher risk of rupture uh, than older, uh, older patients with smaller aneurysms. Well, the UCAS study was a Japanese study published now almost 10 years ago. And the Japanese really mirrored the, the international study of unruptured aneurysms. And uh, the design was very similar. Patients were encountered by physicians and together they decided how best to treat or not treat the lesion. They screened a large number of patients and were able to analyze a little over 5,000 in final analysis. And I realize this slide has a lot of information on it, but I'll focus you on the table because the table is very important. Uh, because what it gives us for the first time is stratification. With this large number of patients, we can stratify by size and site. The unruptured trial, we really couldn't stratify finely by size. But you can see here in this study, we now have some data evolving for aneurysms that are very small in the three to four millimeter range, uh, as well as the medium and large size aneurysms. We did not have that in the international study of unruptured cranial aneurysms. But we also see that there may be more, uh, there might be sites that are more aggressive or more malignant, I should say, in terms of potential for rupture compared to, uh, to, compared to other sites. And in this study, interestingly, they did not find the basilar tip and posterior circulation to be higher risk. They found the anterior uh, communicating artery to be higher risk um, and the internal carotid artery to be higher risk than was defined in the uh, ISHUA trial. And for the first time, you can see here that we do have numbers that are significant in these smaller cells. Uh, you can see here the blue bar is three to six millimeters, so that we now have aneurysms in this size range. And you can see a large number of aneurysms fall in this small size range where, at, where data was emerging in terms of rupture risk. And the conclusions of this study were important. They found that size, specific location, and presence of a daughter sac, and they're the first study to show that an irregularly shaped aneurysm had a higher risk of rupture than a round aneurysm, which many of us had thought for a number of years, but we really didn't have large volume data as they did in this study. All aneurysms greater than seven millimeters were at higher risk of rupture and ACOM and PCOM, but not posterior circulation aneurysms had increased risk of rupture. And interestingly, women and patients with hypertension had an increased risk of rupture. Um, prior subarachnoid hemorrhage, smoking history, family history, and the presence of multiple aneurysms were not associated with increased risk of rupture, which is contrary to a number of other studies. But the point is with this study, we are starting to see data of rupture in unruptured aneurysms stratified by size, site, and irregular shape. Um, here's a situation, a woman we treated, 45-year-old woman with headaches, MRI 
shows a five millimeter middle cerebral aneurysm, a very common scenario that we see almost every day. Here's her CTA, you can see the lesion here. And interestingly, here's her three-dimensional CTA. Uh, at surgery, she proves to have an irregular bleb on the aneurysm, and actually in retrospect had this in the pre-op studies. And the question is, what is this woman's five-year risk of rupture? We think it's quite high. She's young, she's got a long life horizon, and an irregular shape aneurysm carries with it a higher risk of rupture than a round, simple aneurysm. Another question that comes up regarding size is the so-called size ratio, that is the size of the artery to the parent vessel. And the question is, do smaller distal vessels with smaller aneurysms have the same risk of rupture as larger aneurysms on larger vessels? We looked at this and uh, Bob Carter and I and several other investigators looked at this a number of years ago in our data set that we had at the time, a little over 1600 aneurysms. And we were able to look at ruptured and unruptured aneurysms based on uh, site and size of the parent vessel. And you can see that for pike of lesions and more distal MCA and ACA lesions, that rupture was not trivial in these size aneurysms. Even though the aneurysm was smaller, the rupture rate was still significant. Now, it's flawed, it's retrospective data, but we use size as a surrogate uh, and for, for parent vessel size and found that indeed, um, uh, the more distal aneurysms could rupture at a smaller size. The other question that comes up, do aneurysms change size prior to or after rupture? Well, here's a situation as a 64 year old, she had three unruptured aneurysms, but also had this temporal lobe glioma. And uh, given the malignant nature of her tumor, we elected to not treat the aneurysms, but take out her to resect the glioma. And sure enough, eight months after having her tumor resected, she hemorrhaged from her ACOM aneurysm. And in retrospect, this was an irregularly shaped ACOM aneurysm uh, pardon me, A2 aneurysm, that um, uh, I think today we'd, we'd probably be more aggressive about treating. But when we looked at uh, unruptured aneurysms that had went on to rupture, we had a population of patients where we had said, look, let's, let's not treat your aneurysm, let's follow you over time. Unfortunately, they went on to rupture. We combined this with, with colleagues around the country and had a series of 13 patients and found that in these patients, um, uh, it, there really wasn't a significant change in size of aneurysm after rupture. So the conclusion was, as shown at the bottom of this slide, unruptured aneurysms do not shrink when they rupture, and the percentage of smaller aneurysms were small prior to rupture. So regarding size, a glaring fact that's left unanswered is that when patients present with aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhage, 80% of them have lesions less than 10 millimeters, 50% less than five millimeters. Therefore, when unruptured lesions are small, we're saying they're less likely to bleed. Yet when aneurysms bleed, they're likely to be small. And there's really not a great explanation for that. Some people say, well, there's a lot of patients out there with small aneurysms and some of them go on to hemorrhage, but that can't be the only answer. There's a publication from 2019 from New York, which looked at a lot of uh, publications and, and did a meta-analysis looking at size of aneurysm versus risk versus rupture presentation. And what they found over time epic is that they looked at lesions smaller than five millimeters as shown on this table. And as shown in this graph, you look at the different time epochs from 1991 through 2016. And what you see is that for lesions smaller than five millimeters, the number that show up with subarachnoid hemorrhage is going up. So that the most recent epoch, 84% uh, of them are less than 10 millimeters at, uh, uh, at time of presentation. So this is a very confusing and really unanswered uh, point. The other question that comes up multiple aneurysms. Here's multiple aneurysms in a, in a younger woman, 50 year old woman with a strong family history of aneurysms. She has three or four aneurysms, as you can see here on the carotid circulation. The question is, is her risk of rupture three times that of someone with a single aneurysm? And the answer is it's not three times that. It's probably higher, but how much higher is not known. So does a patient with three aneurysms have triple the risk? No, but the risk is probably increased, but by how much is not known. If one has hemorrhaged, the patient's often very motivated to get the other lesions treated regardless of size. So remember that 80% of all ruptured aneurysms that present for treatment are smaller than 10 millimeters. And I say, darn it, 
the office visit for the five millimeter unruptured aneurysm just became an hour trying to explain that to patients who have never heard such data. The phases score is an acronym. Phases is made up of the, uh, from the initials population, hypertension, age, size of aneurysm, earlier subarachnoid, and site. And if you add up these factors, one can get a five-year risk of hemorrhage. And the more of these factors you have, the higher the risk of hemorrhage uh, of, these, uh, of, a, of an unruptured aneurysm. Um, and the UTAS score was a consensus management man it was based on aneurysm specific factors of size, location, and calcification, patient specific factors of age and medical comorbidities. And what the investigators did is asked a panel of us our opinion of rupture risks of patients they presented to us. And what they came up with was a fairly detailed score, as you see here, incorporating a number of factors. And the more of these factors you had, you could influence in a positive or negative way the potential risk of hemorrhage. And I like this diagram that was published by a group that was looking at trying to predict hemorrhage risk from MRI study, because what it shows is in the green, areas that may be lower risk for hemorrhage potential. And in the red, you can see here, larger aneurysms with higher rupture risk and certain locations with higher rupture risks, those aneurysms with higher rupture risks. Also a growing aneurysm, a lesion that's been shown to grow over time, probably has a higher rupture risk and should be treated aggressively. Those with a bleb or a daughter sac uh, have a higher rupture risk. And then it has been looked at the size ratio of neck to dome, although that data is less conclusive. And more recently, people are looking at MR findings of whether the contrast enhancement of the wall might portend which aneurysms are more higher risk of rupture. And then there's the psychology of unruptured aneurysms. Sometimes I feel that we're part psychiatrist, part neurosurgeon, as we discuss with patients uh, management of their unruptured aneurysm, how we're not going to treat it. And we spend many hours in clinic reducing anxiety, particularly for small aneurysms, those without those that are really called out pouchings or irregularities. Uh, those with family history, regardless of size, are very anxious and very motivated to fix their aneurysm. And then there's physician anxiety, that is the primary care physicians, because in medical school, they learned aneurysms were dangerous. And now you're telling them you're not going to treat aneurysms that are smaller. And that has to be explained. So the modifiers of hemorrhagic risk include anatomic factors, size, location, lobularity, and multiplicity of lesions, and patient-specific factors, younger age, family history, ethnicity, patient's anxiety, and whether or not they're smokers. Now let's look at treatment-related risk for unruptured aneurysms. This is an area that I've been fascinated by for a number of years. And the issue of trial, as I mentioned, had a prospective arm looking at morbidity and mortality uh, which was higher than had previously been reported. In fact, you can see here when one includes cognitive outcomes that double digit uh, complication rates were encountered. People walked and talked, but they had cognitive issues which they felt were significant. And risk factors that associated this were age, the older patients, larger lesions and posterior circulation. The same was true for endovascular results to an extent but the number of endovascularly treated patients in this series was so low that it's hard to really make uh, meaningful conclusions. However, I have looked at both retrospective and prospective reports of unruptured aneurysms, and there's always morbidity and mortality with endovascular treatment. We looked at stratification of outcome for surgically treated aneurysms in a little over 600 patients. Um, in, uh, this is now a data from uh, when we did much more open surgery. The distribution of, and we were clipping about 80% of the aneurysms that we treated at the time. You can see it was a fairly standard practice with about 90% of the lesions being in the anterior circulation. Here's the size range of lesions that we treated. And we did stepwise, stepwise uh, logistic regression analysis and showed that posterior circulation, aneurysm size and age <clears throat> in a univariate analysis, which are the significant factors associated with poor outcome, uh, but we were able to predict final models and generate curves that looked at outcomes. So here's a 40-year-old 40 with an anterior communicating artery aneurysm, five millimeters in size. And in fact, he was a physical therapist, so knew about out outcome from aneurysm. Here was his 3D view of his aneurysm. He said, what's my risk of a bad outcome? And we could use our curve to tell him it's about 1.8%. 
Here's a graph showing size, uh, showing the risk of poor outcome with upper and lower confidence intervals and the mean size on the, on the middle bar. And for this 40 year old with a five millimeter anterior circulation aneurysm, these are the curves you get. And the age is plotted on the uh, X axis. So in a 70 year old, the risk of poor outcome is much more towards 4%. Whereas in a 40 year old, it's down here at 1.8%. And you can do this for different size aneurysms. Here's what the curves look like for 10 millimeter unruptured anterior circulation lesion by size. Here is by 15 millimeters. And you can see the risk go up based on size and age um, uh, of the patient. Here's a basilar apex aneurysm in a 50 year old. <clears throat> this most certainly would be coiled today. But at the time we were doing the study, we clipped it. She did well. And we came up with risk curves for posterior circulation lesions as well. And in fact, this is just shows a composite graph of anterior and posterior circulation lesions by size and age of patient. And the older a patient is, the larger a lesion is, and the more they're in the posterior circulation, the risks were approaching double digits. And this was right at an interval when endovascular techniques were really being refined coiling was, was really coming into its own. And so we much often referred those patients for endovascular therapy or performed endovascular therapy ourselves. So treatment specific, treatment risks can be stratified by age, medical comorbidities, and lesion specific factors of size, location, calcification if doing surgery, less applicable if uh, in, uh, endovascular, and then the local anatomic details. What's the relation of the parent vessel, the perforators, the branch vessels? So there's stratification of treatment related risks as there is with natural history. And one can highly be highly specific about treatment selection of surgical or endovascular therapy based on patient and aneurysm specific factors. Treatment related risks are not static and they've been gradually coming down with time as we've incorporated endovascular therapies into our overall treatment. There's lots of data publishing risks of treatment of endovascular and surgical results. Um, but in each aneurysm patient we encounter, we feel an analysis can be done incorporating lesion and patient specific factors. And really we now utilize what most centers utilize, which is a synergistic treatment of unruptured aneurysms. Synergy being defined as surgery when appropriate and endovascular when we appropriate, trying to minimize risks and maximize outcomes. If you look at previous studies for the treatment of unruptured aneurysms, most reports are of surgical or endovascular outcomes. And often it's couched in terms of clip versus coil or surgery versus endovascular. And the data on true combined modality management really is not that prevalent. There's a couple of papers uh, in, the, in the late 2000s. So we went about looking at our data in a more synergistic way, because when we encountered patients, we would recommend therapy based on what we thought was highest risk, high, lowest risk and highest efficacy. And here is a, a study we performed and published about a year and a half ago, um, and a little over 650 patients a little six to 50 aneurysms and 553 patients treated at our institution over a three-year interval. And we used open surgical technique, which was mostly clipping, although we did some bypass and occlusions, and endovascular techniques of direct coiling, stent-assisted coiling, balloon-assisted coiling, or flow diversion. And we, cho we chose the treatment modality based on the predicted risk factor for that patient. So we're using aneurysm-specific and patient-specific factors in our decision-making for endovascular or surgical obliteration. Now, there is selection bias in this group. So during this same interval, as I mentioned to you, we spend a lot of our time counseling people on what you're, why you're not gonna get treatment. So same, during the same interval, when we treated 600 aneurysms, we also counseled 960 patients on why they didn't need treatment. And that was based on either aneurysm size, patient comorbidity, age of patient, size of aneurysm, all these factors where we felt treatment was not indicated. So we, we saw a lot of patients that we did not in fact uh, treat in the long run. This is published uh, in World Neurosurgery. You can see um, this was in 2019. So you can go read the results if you like. 
Uh, we use the same logistic regression modeling as we used for our surgical curves that I showed you earlier, but this is combined outcome results. And when you do this, there's a couple things that come out. This was the study population. And as in most all uh, unruptured series, uh, a little under 80% were female. Usually runs about 70, 30, 70% female, 20, 20 or 30% male. You can see that the majority of our lesions were in the anterior circulation, almost 90%. And our, in terms of our modality of treatment, we clipped 38% uh, of the lesions, coiled 10%, stent assisted coiling 13% and used flow diversion, which at the time is pipeline only, you know, almost 40% or 37%, almost 38% of the patients. And here shows the size of aneurysms that we treated, um, uh, very much like the surgical curves that I showed you from an earlier epoch. And here was the age distribution of patients that we treated. And we treated some patients in their 80s who were robust, uh, might've had larger lesions, but they themselves were in good shape uh, uh, physiologically. And people ask me, you know, how did you treat these patients? So I show them this data. Uh, this is by size, either surgical or endovascular. And remember, this isn't surgery versus endovascular. These were decisions made to use endovascular or surgical treatments based on the factors that I've already elucidated. And you can see that in the larger lesions, we tended to favor an endovascular strategy uh, and now the trade-off sometimes is efficacy, but not always, particularly with flow diversion. Um, and here is a percentage of procedures stratified by aneurysm location. And what you see here is that we still do open surgery on a fair number of MCA aneurysms. And this may be changing with some of the intrasacular devices, web device, and some of the other devices that are now being developed. Uh, and that we do a high incidence of flow diversion in the internal carotid artery. You can see that uh, many more of these patients were treated endovascularly, which is the yellow bar, as opposed to surgically. And the anterior communicating is about half and half in terms of our surgical and endovascular uh, treatment of these lesions. Well, how did these patients fare? How did they do? Based on the final model, we could uh, predict probability curves for these different patients. And very unlike the, the curves I showed you for size versus age versus outcome, uh, for the surgical results, here there was a much uh, less effect of age on outcome. And you can see that by using endovascular and surgical techniques, here is for anterior circulations less than five millimeters. You can see that half, about half and half were treated endovascularly versus surgically. You can see the number in each group. And here is for small posterior circulation lesions, a higher percentage treated endovascularly, but surgery also used with good results because they're smaller lesions. Um, and, by, by, and then you can see it graph by age. The same is true as the lesions get larger here that our, our, our error bars go up, but that the curves tend to be rather flat or slow, very slight uh, increase in, in, in uh, complication with age. Well, what were the complications in this series? And here I show you uh, the non-neurologic complications. You can see this was both surgical and endovascular complications. So you can see that um, uh, these are a lot of these are endovascular complications. Obviously, pseudoaneurysm of the femoral artery is an endovascular complication, retroperitoneal hematoma, and then how they were managed with either surgery or expectant management. Hemothorax, pneumothorax, this was in surgical patients. Same too with surgical site infection. Those were surgical patients. But our total complication rate, non-neurologic, were 28 patients, which was a little over 4%, 4.2%. But thankfully, none of these resulted in permanent morbidity. All of these were surmountable problems. Not true with neurologic complications. And here are the neurologic complications for this series. And you can see that we had both hemorrhagic and ischemic stroke, as well as cranial nerve palsies. Um, and we tried to put the results uh, all together. And their final outcome in terms of modified Rankin score is shown here. And what you can see is there's a total of 38 patients that had complications when we treated them in this synergistic fashion. Uh, thankfully, the majority of these did well, but still seven patients did poorly or uh, none, uh, none, uh, none died but um, uh, you can see seven were badly injured by, by the treatment, 1%. 
uh, and a total of 5.7% complication. And this was of 658 total aneurysms. So in terms of complications, there was no permanent morbidity from the 4.2% of procedures with non-neurologic complications. Of the 38 patients or 5.7% of procedures with neurologic complications, only seven or 1% resulted in permanent severe neurologic deficits, but it's still seven patients. And those are the seven you tend to remember more than others. So we then went back and compared these results to the curves I showed you earlier. Uh, similar size, similar distribution of patients. Now, I couldn't lay them on the same graph because our old study, we looked at Glasgow outcome scale, which is a little cruder. And in the current study, we looked at modified Rankin scale in terms of outcome. But what you can see is that in our current study, the risk factors run in the low single digits. And remember in our old series, which was just surgery, the results uh, were more significant with age and size of aneurysm and started to approach double digits for the posterior, larger posterior circulation lesions. Each, a little over 600 patients in each of these uh, series and epoch studied, although a different epoch in time. And this just shows a plot of risk of hemorrhage using the UCAS data, the Japanese data, for different size aneurysms. And what it shows is that even for smaller aneurysms, five to six millimeters, three to four millimeters, if you project their hemorrhage rate using binomial probability, which is the appropriate calculation to use, you can see that there's a five-year rupture rate, a little around 2%. So that if in a young individual, you can keep your risk of treatment in the low single digits. You may talk to that individual about justifying treatment, uh, either endovascular or surgical for that individual. So in our conclusion of this study, synergistic utilization of surgery and endovascular techniques reduced the overall risk of treatment. There obviously was high selection bias in terms of who was treated. Even older patients who had low comorbidities and projected good life expectancy were considered for treatment. Um, and given the lower risks, treatment may be considered in patients with older age or younger patients with smaller lesions compared to 10 or 15 years ago. I'd like just to comment briefly on screening for intracranial aneurysms because it's an area we've been doing a lot of active research. Now, the guidelines for management of patients with unruptured aneurysms, of which I was one of the co-authors, uh, was last published in 2015. And in these guidelines, the screening recommendations for patients uh, for general population were based on class one data, two or more family members with aneurysm or subarachnoid hemorrhage, or a history of autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease, particularly with a family history. And then there's class 2A reasonable, where it was reasonable to screen patients with aortic coarctation or primordial dwarfism. Well, one issue that we've looked at, uh, and, and the initial screening was, was, is initiated at young adulthood. This says 25 to 30. I usually recommend screening usually at the age of 20. And then repeating that screening every 10 years, which came out of this statement paper from uh, the National, from uh, American Heart Association. Well, looking at smoking, this is certainly a factor for aneurysms. We all know this is probably a factor that helps in the development of aneurysms as well as an aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhage. It's been associated with aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhage. It's been associated with poor outcomes. It's been suggested to play a role in aneurysm development. So we conducted a study to look at the prevalence of aneurysms in smokers, and particularly in women who smoke, because women are more likely to have unruptured aneurysms. So we thought they would be the most at risk or highest prevalence of having aneurysms. And we also looked at the association between smoking, um, smoking and aneurysms in a case control fashion. Uh, and we did this from an initial cohort of little over 2000 patients, females between 30 and 60 years who had a brain MRA at our institution over a two year interval. There was no family history of aneurysm, and we made sure there was no previous unruptured aneurysm, connective tissue disorders, or polycystic kidney disease. And we asked, what is the prevalence of unruptured aneurysm based on smoking status? And what we found was that in screening these little over 2,000 patients, as we worked through the decision tree in a, in a case control fashion, we can see that the prevalence, the overall prevalence of unruptured intracranial aneurysms in non-smokers was 1.9%. And you can see here the asymptomatic and symptomatic rates. 
the overall prevalence in smoking in women who smoke was 19%. So it's 10 times higher. Uh, and you can see here the asymptomatic and symptomatic rates of discovery. Now, when looked at in a case controlled uh, fashion, what we found was that the, the relative risk was significantly higher in women who smoke and women with hypertension. We then conducted a multi-center uh, study. The overall, so this center, single center incidence, single center study demonstrated the prevalence I noted. And then in females that smoke cigarettes, an odds ratio of 5.8 in those who smoke, an odds ratio of 3.8 in those with hypertension, and females that smoke and had hypertension, there was an odds ratio of a whopping 12.6%, 12.6, not percent. So the question was, does treating unruptured aneurysms reduce the number of subarachnoid hemorrhages from aneurysms? I should comment that this last number was from a pooled data of five centers where we did an analysis uh, uh, in terms of uh, smoking and hypertension. And that is also published in Journal of Neurology, Neurosurgery and Psychiatry. Well, one question comes up is, does treating unruptured aneurysms reduce the number of subarachnoids? And there's no way to really know this, but we went and looked at the National Inpatient Database and we examined treatment trends for unruptured and ruptured aneurysms and developed, evaluated the relative risk ratios of unruptured and ruptured aneurysms to, compared to, compared to uh, uh, matched controls. Um, uh, and in looking at this, no surprise, we found that clipping has decreased over time and coiling has increased over time in terms of the treatment. This is in ruptured aneurysms on the left and unruptured aneurysms on the right graph, where you see clipping has remained relatively stable over time in the United States, but coiling rates have increased significantly over time. Now, when we looked at the relative risk ratio compared to match controls, uh, the number of ruptured aneurysms here is shown on the left as decreasing, and the number of unruptured aneurysms being treated is, in, is increasing. Now, this doesn't categorically prove that treating unruptured aneurysms decrease subarachnoid hemorrhage risk, but the observation is there for uh, consideration. So other factors that are considered for unruptured aneurysm patients, if an aneurysm is not treated, should, how should it be followed or should it be followed? And there is a, an evolving literature on this in terms of uh, the Japanese and others have done some studies looking at this. Uh, and should you do this with annual or every five-year radiographic studies? It still is not an answered question and decision analysis can be used but isn't perfect, but it impacts significantly on the economics of healthcare. It's a great topic for future study. The other question that comes up with someone with an unruptured aneurysm that isn't treated is what's the appropriate uh, activity level for that individual, especially with the small unruptured treatment. Can they lift weights? Can they work out? Can they have sex? Can they live their normal lives? And of course, if we're gonna say they're low enough risk to not treat, I encourage people to just live their lives normally uh, with that unruptured aneurysm. So in general, in closing, my thoughts at present are that younger patients with aneurysms larger than four to six millimeters, we generally consider for treatment. The younger the patient, the stronger the consideration for treatment. And we've found that a weekly conference attended by all of our, uh, our physicians who are interested in aneurysms and vascular disease, neurologists, radiologists, neurovascular surgeons, it's extremely helpful to get together and review the films, review the patient data to help make decisions about management of these lesions. Um, at present, patients are still evaluated on a case-by-case -case basis trying to incorporate true morbidity of treatment balanced against the best estimate of the natural history for that individual. In addition, the psychological and social factors are often important in the final decision of how to treat an unruptured aneurysm. For an unruptured aneurysm, once the decision is made to treat a patient, we then decide how to treat a patient. And we open it up for any endovascular or surgical technique that we think will be lowest risk and highest efficacy of getting rid of that lesion. And here we enter the realm of artificial intelligence. And will artificial intelligence be helpful in the decision-making process of how to manage an unruptured aneurysm? The problem to date is that artificial intelligence is at the mercy of the information we have at hand, which is imperfect. Uh, but it is coming to pass as we can place many patients with large data in these artificial intelligence paradigm, that it may become a tool that may be useful in helping us in decision-making.
So I will stop there. I will thank you for your attention. Um, I'm happy to entertain any questions people type in uh, or discussions, David, if you have thoughts at this point, but thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Ogilvy. As always, an outstanding lecture. So um, we have a few questions from the public. The first question is, is endovascular management the first choice to treat any aneurysm? So that's an excellent question. And you know, uh, when you say any aneurysm, a lot of places uh, have adopted an endovascular first uh, approach to both unruptured and ruptured aneurysms. I think at our institution, it is a much stronger consideration for the ruptured aneurysm. For the unruptured aneurysm, we really try to think through the risks of endovascular and surgical management and offer what we think is lowest risk and highest efficacy. So it's not always an immediate endovascular first. In fact, there are some configurations of aneurysms um, uh, that are higher risk to treat endovascularly than surgically. And that's something that's very difficult to convey to a patient because everyone thinks lower, uh, less invasive should be lower risk, but it's not always the case. And I've seen MCA aneurysms with attempted treatment elsewhere that ended in uh, bad strokes because of uh, an attempt at an endovascular strategy, which in, in uh, capable surgical hands can be a low risk procedure uh, with a patient who's out of the hospital in a couple of days and has an excellent recovery. Thank you very much. Uh, there's another question here. Um, what should be the maximum age to treat a <laughs> ruptured aneurysm? Uh, that's a great question. And it's one we grapple with all the time uh, because we're encountering patients who are physiologically younger and younger despite their chronologic age. Uh, as the population ages, many people are adapting healthy lifestyles, particularly in where I am in New England in the Boston area. So you'll encounter a 70 year old who runs three times a week, uh, has no heart issues, no lung issues, non-smoker, and physiologically is more like a 55, 60 year old. And if you can offer that patient low risk treatment, um, the, and, uh, we, we do so. Now you can predict, uh, there are, calculators, there are uh, predictors of life expectancy. And the people who are interested in this are the insurance companies because they wanna know how long people are live because they have to know how long they're gonna insure them for. So you can actually go online right now during this talk, go on the uh, you know big um, insurance company website and Mutual of Omaha or one of the other big companies, type in your age, your social habits, whether you drink, whether you smoke, how much you exercise, few other details, and they can generate what your life expectancy is. Sometimes it's a little depressing, but there are people who are, are uh, so we don't have a fixed age. We really gauge it on the individual. Okay, thank you. There's another question here. The phases score is biased on ethnicity. Doesn't involve Asian and other races, which according to you is the best score. That's a, a great question. And the, the phases store does have one of the elements built into the phases of ethnicity. And that's because the Scandinavian population and the Japanese population, when it's been looked at, seem to have a higher risk per size of aneurysm. So those two ethnicities are, are built into that score. It might not be the perfect score. And that's, this is the type of area where artificial intelligence may help us. Uh, to refine some type of scoring system that would be even better than the phase of score. But it's one of the things we look at uh, as we encounter patients with unruptured aneurysms. It's certainly not the only thing. Thank you. Isn't the vascular management the only choice to treat uh, blister-like aneurysm? So that's another great question. So I think of blister aneurysms as a, a particularly that term as applies to ruptured aneurysms and of the carotid artery between the, between the clinoid and, and really between the clinoid and the posterior communicating artery. And what it really is usually is a pseudo aneurysm and dissection. It's a very dangerous aneurysm. Those of us who've operated on a number of them, and I used to operate on them all the time, uh, know that the intraoperative rupture rate is about 90%. 
and that, that you can't always clip them. Often you have to wrap them uh, or stent graft them or bypass them, all of which I have done. I must say that over the last uh, eight years, uh, you know, a pipeline's been approved in the United States for 10 years. And over the last eight or nine years, when I've encountered such an aneurysm, we have used flow diversion. And we have used it successfully. I know there are people that have not used it successfully. That is, they've had issues where there's been re-rupture, uh, but thankfully we, we have not has seen that situation. The key in that situation, if you do use flow diversion is once you put it in, don't look at the aneurysm for about three months <laughs> because for the first few I put in, I did angiograms every week or two and the aneurysm was still there. The patient did not re-hemorrhage and by three months, the aneurysm was gone. And the patient at that point had made a recovery. Um, uh, but increasingly, our strategies for pseudoaneurysm and rupture in the carotid circulation, which are called blister aneurysms, or in the vertebral circulation, which are just called pseudoaneurysms and dissections, are being managed with flow diversion. Okay, thank you. Do calcified, do calcified atheromatous plaques inside on rupture aneurysms increase the risk of hemorrhage? That, to my knowledge, is unknown. Um, certainly when we look at aneurysms at surgery, you can see part of them, and I, I didn't show any videos, I didn't want to take up the time, but I have videos showing that there's parts of the aneurysm that are calcified like a rock, and then right next to it, a paper thin area. We do know that, as you know, the person who asked that question, <laughs> I'm almost sure knows, it makes it harder to clip those lesions. Um, uh, because as the clip is applied, if the aneurysm rupture, you usually have one chance to apply that clip pr uh, properly because once they rupture, they can become a bear to deal with intraoperatively. Um, uh, but uh, I think they, that calcification may increase the rusk, risk of rupture while clipping them. I don't think it's ever been shown that calcification increases the rupture, the natural history rupture risk. For a while, there was folklore that it decreased it because it kind of made this hard shell, but that's not the case. Okay. Low levels of LDL cholesterol has been related to an increase in intracranial hemorrhage. What is your opinion regarding this molecule as a risk factor for aneurysm rupture? I, I, don't, I don't know the exact answer to that. I know the, the paper and the, ref, the reference that's being made here um, uh, to aneurysm risk. One thing that endovascular therapy has done has refocused our attention on the biology of aneurysms, the flow biology and, and the aneurysm wall biology. A couple things come out of that. With flow diversion, we've learned that adults have the ability to remodel their intracranial vessels. I have patients, smokers for years, terribly atherosclerotic, tortuous vessel, and two years after putting a flow diverter in, the carotid artery looks like a 20-year-old. It's, it's, it's a nice parallel wall vessel. It's, it's almost unbelievable. Um, and we are very interested in studying endothelial progenitor cells and how they repair vessel injury. And this relates to the question about LDL cholesterol, because there's probably an interplay, a balance of LDL, HDL cholesterol in the aneurysmal wall. And that it, and superimposed on that is an influence of shear stress in the aneurysmal wall produced by the hemodynamics. So you have two things. One is the aneurysmal wall biology that is brought up by this question and the pulse wave velocity in that wall. And the second issue is the hemodynamics, the flow in and out of the aneurysm and how that influences the cellular environment of the aneurysm. Great question. Okay. In a case of a patient with an unruptured giant pericolosal artery aneurysm with medial frontal cognitive signs and first episode of seizure in an elderly patient more than 70 years old, what would be the treatment of choice? Conservative management, surgery? Well, in that situation, you have or a 70, I've, I have met that exact patient and uh, uh, I've actually met them coming out of a nursing home. And the reason they're in a nursing home is their aneurysm and it's the mass effect. Now, mass effect's an interesting thing. If you have time, you can treat the patient endovascularly with flow diversion and the mass effect goes away, but it takes three or four years for that size aneurysm. So those are patients I'm pretty aggressive about 
decreasing the mass effect with consideration of surgery, sometimes an intracranial anterior cerebral to anterior cerebral bypass is necessary. We've written that up. Um, uh, but but uh, certainly, I would strongly consider treatment based on their other comorbidities. If the cognitive decline is thought relative to that aneurysm and there's edema about it, we tend to be pretty aggressive. Okay, thank you. Given that the prevalence of abruptor aneurysms in female smokers and female smokers with hypertension is so high, should screening guidelines be updated to include routing screening for these patients? Thank you, thank you. So this is, I will be giving that abstract in a couple of weeks uh, at a national meeting in the United States. And my argument will be that we've reached a point because there's one other data I didn't show you We've just concluded a decision analysis showing that screening women is actually cost effective. In other words, you, the society saves more money to screen women, find the aneurysms and fix them, than let them go on to rupture um, and suffer. You know, the, the economy then has to carry a devastated patient. So yes, my answer to that is yes. I've talked to the folks in Scandinavia. They say they've been doing it for years already. They screen women who smoke. Okay, mm, so posterior circulation aneurysms are underrepresented in all current series and scores. What do you recommend specifically in this kind of aneurysm to decide to treat? Well, they they are underrepresented, and the other the other kind of uh, uh, unknown is you know we're just learning about how do those aneurysms respond to flow diversion, and sometimes you can get a pretty nice X-ray in a pretty bad patient. Uh, and we don't know that answer. So it's something we all grapple with. Um, I, and uh, certainly we've all had complications dealing with posterior circulation lesions. Uh, as you probably know, many more of these lesions are now being treated endovascularly than surgically. Whether that's right or not, we, we still don't know. I, I still treat uh, pica aneurysms, um, smaller pica aneurysms, more peripheral lesions surgically. Uh, I think it's straightforward. It's, it's got a high, ra high rate of cure. Uh, midline lesions, basilar lesions, larger lesions, we are favoring endovascular treatment. And those tend to be in the older patients. Okay, thank you. So last question is, um, do you think endovascular management will one day evolve to the point where often <laughs> surgery disappears? Well, that's the that's the big question, and it's certainly an evolving an evolving area. The other the other corollary to that is, as endovascular techniques become more widespread, how do we maintain our surgical expertise? I am spoiled. I was raised in an era where I have operated on over forty two hundred aneurysms, and those surgeries have taught me certain things in certain ways. And people say, how are we going to get that same experience if we're just beginning our career today? There's no good answer for that. People, you know, you have simulators, you have, uh, uh, you know, open lectures, we have videos, but there's no replacement for doing the surgery. But unfortunately, that comes at the cost of learning about complications the hard way. And surgery is such a nuanced, uh, highly technical field that um, we just don't know that answer. I, I think we still need to maintain surgical expertise and have it in our armamentarium on a regular basis to treat these patients. Thank you. On behalf of the CN, I'd like to thank you again, Dr. Ogilvy. This has been a wonderful lecture. We're really grateful and honored for your participation in the 2021 IWDNC. David, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure and an honor. For all the audience, keep in mind this lecture will be available on our website starting next week. Uh, we currently have Dr. Jack Marcus doing his lecture, Bypass Surgery for Moya Moya and Cerebral Ischemia, Flow Dynamics, Technical Variations, and Outcomes in a Large Series. To get the link for this upcoming conference, please follow the link pinned on the chat screen or check the program schedule on our website, cnhost.com. Thank you very much. <laughs>